Welcome back to The Rake. I'm really excited about our guest today. Um, I got to say, I kind of debased myself a little bit to get this guest on. I did something that is not in line with my core values because I really wanted to have him for you. I set an alarm clock for this podcast. And for those of you who don't know me and don't understand, like, I would not set an alarm clock for Jamie's funeral. That's how important it was to me to have this guy on for you. We have Fader Holtz on the podcast today, uh, just before his challenge with Victor Malinowski. Did I say that right? Limitless. Uh, Fedor, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm curious, because this challenge was actually issued six months ago, and you accepted very recently. What happened in the six months between Victor challenging you and your acceptance? Um, I think two main blocks. One was me playing the Legend Showdown, I think it was called. Um, and that, I think, was the next six six weeks or eight weeks. Um, and then there was the Dark Polk and Nigriano heads-up match afterwards, um, plus me having some personal things going on. And so I've always been thinking, like I've been, after that, I've been chatting with him back and forth and uh, just wanted to hear if he's serious about it. And so, uh, yeah, I got back to it when it, when it fitted uh, a bit better in my, in my plans. Nice. Um, so I'm going to have to make fun of you for retiring from poker, uh, which is a thing that everyone does and then unretires themselves. But you know that I picked on you for this ages ago. Um, <laughs> I remember. I said, McGregor retires like poker players retire. And I just got the three eye roll emojis. So I would like you to explain yourself now. You're back. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say I'm back. And it's it's very, I, I found that actually, I mean, in the in the moment or years back to th- like four or five years ago, um, it definitely, it definitely hurt a bit. It, it was this constant, like it was constantly a topic. Everyone brought it up. It was like, oh, you know, he's back. And um now with more distance, I I find it actually more interesting that this was such a big topic um, because I personally felt like exa- still feel exactly like that as I went from playing basically my entire life or or time to basically playing not at all, um, and that felt like um, stopping to play for me. So I think over the last four years, I probably played less than. Uh, 100 tournaments a year or or fit, like including online so it was like two three live stops and then um like a w coop sunday here and there so it was for me it was basically poker being out of my life mm-hmm. um so i wouldn't say i'm back in terms of playing i play maybe once a week once every two weeks right now i played a bit more during corona that's true but i don't consider myself uh to, oh, to wow. be back to being so, a pro so i i just pro. learned on this pod that i also am retired for the amount of poker that I play but yeah that's actually an interesting take I I think for people who have not gone 100% hard at poker um, they don't know what your life was like before you retired from that life so you're like retired from the crazy grind that you put yourself through but you're still probably playing you know as much poker as some other people who consider themselves pros yeah I think I think it's also uh, an emotions or other emotions I think that get mixed into this whole topic of maybe it's envy or um some form of like release you know to um towards my my good run um in that year and then um I just felt that in lots of different ways like I I feel there were always these very subtle expressions of of some form of uh yeah, anger towards me or or whatever. Form of emotion. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, I want to talk about that good run because you had an almost uh, unprecedented run at the top. You were winning everything, and I think you are one of the the few guys who ever really genuinely went out. Since we are considering this a real retirement, even though you play occasionally, but you you really went out on top. Can you talk about the motivation because that's something that's so rare i think it's basically like you and maybe dan coleman 
are the only people I can think of that uh, were really at the peak of the game and decided to step away. I think most other people, um, myself included, go on, you know, like a slide down from their peak before they decide they're fed up with it. What what motivated you to step away uh, at the peak of your powers? Um, for you, it looks like a peak. For me, it didn't feel like a peak. I think that's just the easy explanation. Um, I, I would say that the main driver behind that uh, decision was I just didn't feel great about it at all. And I, I think if you look at it from, from the external standpoint, you can look at the, the, the dollars and, and the money I won, which I, I think it's the main, the main thing people judge it on. And they're like, wow, he's, you know, he's in this incredible good run. Um, but for me, um, how it felt, it was more, um, more exhaust, much more exhausting um, than my years before. Um, it was the year where I felt the most drained after playing poker, where I got back home uh, from Vegas. And I, as, as you said already, it's my expectations were, you know, maybe it's 100K in EV and then I win whatever, 15 million. So it, it, it was just bursting every, every I, even if I thought about, oh, you know, if it runs well, I, I win 500K. Um, and then, and then this happened. So, um, I wasn't thinking about it. And I think that was the clear indicator for me is when I was running so, so well in financial terms, but I still didn't feel great about it. And that for me was the the very, very clear, uh, signal to say, okay, that that's not the path forward. And, uh, I, I feel I'm very happy about my, my choice back then, because I feel I make the best learnings when I, when I do it, um, when I get to experience the, the extremes on both spectrums. So when I, like, I know how it is to play a ton and I know how it is to not play at all. And then I get a better feeling to center it somewhere to find like, ah, okay, I don't want to play not at all, but I maybe want to play sometimes, but I definitely don't want to play all the time. But when I slide it down, when I go from playing 3000 hours a year and every stop to 2,500 hours a year, I might never find out that I actually want to play, you know, 200 hours a year. So mm -hmm. that that was a big and important experience for me. Yeah, you um you posted a little while ago, and this kind of will help us get into all the other businesses and um, interests that you have. Uh, Brian Rast posted word of the day, Ikigai. And I've thought about this a lot because I'm someone who also left a career that was going to make me somewhat wealthy and very unhappy. Um, but on paper, I would have looked very successful. My family would have been happy if I was a lawyer, if I was a partner by now. Um, but I've thought about this a lot. Um, the diagram is really cool. I might be pronouncing it wrong, but it's a guy where it talks about um, what you love, what you're good at, what you can be paid for and what the world needs. And if you can find that in the middle, it's like your life's purpose. It'll make you happy. It'll make you fulfilled. It'll make you useful to society. Um, how much do you think about like this? Did this have a a part in you kind of stepping away from poker and starting new businesses? Um, and how is it all going for your search for Ikiga? I, I love that you that you picked that out. Um, I, I think life is never as simple as a diagram, but but it was a great um, a great spark of an idea when I was looking at that and I, I looked at it and I was like, oh yeah, I, I can make money with this. I, I'm really good at it. Um, and then I looked at the other two parts and I was like, okay, there will never be an environment where I can really, really contribute something with this. And I wasn't very distinct in what I really enjoy, or, or I wasn't as, as honest with myself and what parts I enjoy and which not, and then being able to say no to the ones I don't want to, to do. And so that was a great, a great kickoff. I, I think I saw that the first time in 2015 or 16 and, uh, since I, I think I posted it on my Twitter a couple of years back as well. And I, I love that Brian picked that up um, just recently. And so, so yeah, I, as an idea, I really like um, Ikigai as a concept. I, I think your feelings around uh, poker and um, creating value for the world, something that the world needs are, are quite similar to mine and something that I've been struggling with. I, I, I think since, 2011, I made a big whiny post on 2 plus 2 about uh, feeling unfulfilled with poker. And then like three months later, I won an EPT and got stuck in for another five years or whatever. Um, but 
talk to us about how you have, because I think you're very methodical and introspective about how you choose to structure your life. So talk to us about your method in the pursuit of Ikigai. Yeah, so I, I would say um, I was much more methodical and much more pursuing. <laughs> um, and I guess the biggest change is I, I think in terms of poker, it's for me, it's it's interesting to look back and try to feel myself also into what's what's the flow or the main things that that I believe led to um, what I was doing. And it's it's interesting that uh, a lot of it is definitely fear of something. So I I could very clearly feel the a distinction between things that I'm just really genuinely passionate about and don't really I, I don't think about what it's going to get me or how much money I'm going to make with it or like it's just literally about this single moment where I play a hand of poker and I'm like a child excited about finding out like the solving the puzzle and finding a solution like this this was a main driver I think that I got very good is just this this natural curiosity the same way I'm learning chess right now it's just there's nothing for me in it it's just uh, I, I like it and I enjoy that and I have that in a lot of different areas too it's it's basically not really thematically limited um, it's curious curiosity for things I, I feel that are expanding my horizon so that's I, I think a very um, a, a very good feeling and a very natural drive and then there's this other part um, that this is always entangled with is like a I would say something that is more trained um, and what you maybe also called methodical, which, which I had to think of is this idea of putting it in a, in a storyline, like creating a box around this. So now it's at a certain point, it started to become relevant. Other people started to get interesting and interested in it. And then I felt pressure both like mostly that I just make up myself is I need to have a plan. I need to have, a way to explain it. I need to have a way forward. I need to have goals. I need to do something with that. And that I, I think is, is exactly that, that, um, that take that took over. So I could see between like 2013, 2014 and 2016, where in the beginning it was just me and my friends playing a game for fun. And none of us was really like, I, I was super happy in my little apartment, just with my friends talking poker every day. I didn't really think about the difference between, 50k and a million like they, it, that didn't really exist that didn't even matter either and then 2015 16 when it was much more about how much ev am i making which trips am i going to how do i structure my day how do i maximize this entire like i need to take advantage of this opportunity that that was a, a theme that was very also what rank am i like gpi matters how other people perceive me where am I in the ranking and stuff like this, this be suddenly became much more relevant. Um, and so I would say, um, yeah, that's mostly stemming from a fear is like, I, 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 I'm insecure about myself in some areas and it, it, this gives me this approval. It, it um, also negates or, or takes away that fear of being left alone because that's the thing that I learned is like, okay, when, when you're successful, then people are interested in you. And then I think going through that process of realizing, wait a second, yes, maybe that's what I believe to to some degree, but it's actually like I I need to feel good with it too. And it's it's not that fun if I if I do all that and I think I need to do all that, but I actually don't really feel like doing it. And I think that was the first time in the last five years where this really became a topic for me. And I've been working through that the last couple of years. Yeah. Uh, well, you mentioned chess and I would definitely want to touch on that later because I'm getting obsessed with it myself. But um, <laughs> a lot of the things you're saying, I had one session with Elliot Rowe that Jen Shahadi actually gave me for my birthday. And I thought I was like, oh, I didn't really want to go to a therapist for all this. And um, his advice to me was so grounded in poker. Like he clearly understands poker players um, mm. and very guy like I don't know. It was way more focused on like what I want out of my career and way less focused on just like the general like fortune cookie kind of advice. Um, and he really helped me in one session just realize that like, no, I don't want to be playing hundred dollar tournaments in New Jersey online. Like this is not what I want to do. It won't fulfill me. Even if I got to be the best player at that 
in this field, like I wouldn't care. Um, and we talked a lot about like goals and what I want and, and basically like finding my purpose and all this stuff. Um, a lot of the things you're saying just remind me of what he, he talked about. And, um, I want to ask you like, how did Elliot Rowe come into your life? Um, how did it start out as like a therapist, um, kind of thing? And then how did you start primed mind? How is that all going? Because I feel like you've helped a, a lot of people with that. So the way it started was I was just in a not so great spot. I felt pretty alone with my feelings. So it, it was 2015 and it was right after basically I won W Coupe Maine and in 2014. And then I started playing Super High Rollers. And it was a year where it was this, the, the perception was I'm touched by God. And it's, it's just, <laughs> I'm running incredibly well. And it, it's also at that time, um, I, I don't, I'm lacking words to describe it, but it was, it felt like a lot of pressure to not be able to, um, to really be myself or to express a bit softer or weaker sides of mine. And, and I, I think I could really tell that after some time is that, um, I, I love that environment for learning, but I also felt like I, I can't really be fully there. So I didn't really express, um, how it felt bad uh, to lose 10 months in a row. And everyone, like the moment I started talking about it, it's like, oh, you've just been running so good. Stop talking about it. And and so I just kept that to myself. And I realized after nine or 10 months, I, I lost like half my bankroll. Um, and I felt like I was at the peak of my game. And it really it really um, was difficult for me. Mm. A lot around expectations I had for myself. And I felt others have uh, around me and making myself a lot of pressure. And so... Elliot was the person where I felt I could share all that and I could just talk about all that and it didn't need to have a meaning. It was just, I could talk about it. Then oftentimes when I talked about it, a lot of things became uh, more clear or, or be put in a different perspective for me. And just the way he was asking questions uh, really helped me process certain things. But it was mostly about um, having a space where I could just express these things in a they weren't judged. They didn't mean something. And it, there was no, no real reaction of someone saying like, Oh, you need to do that or stop doing that. Or, uh, that it was just there. And that, that was a great start. And I realized from myself, um, also to take more responsibility for myself to say, Oh, that's, that's great. I want to do more of that and not be so dependent on what, ha you know, what the other person's doing or what I get in return, but it's more like, I, I, I want to express that, uh, it's important to me. And if it's not important to you, then, uh, great but then we're not very close the one thing you said that made me think of Elliot though was like the the fear that if you're not successful you won't have your friends around you like mm. people will stop loving you as much if you don't win a bunch of high rollers it's so insane to feel that way um because it's like the people who will stop liking you if you don't win are so unimportant in your life but I had that feeling in the back of my mind too and I remember talking to Elliot about that in my one session when I have tons of other things that are probably more important to talk about just being like you do feel more alone if you kind of are like fading into the background in poker and people all want to interview you and like hang out with you and go on dinner break with you if you're doing well it doesn't make any sense but it is a fear that I wonder if more poker players feel that in the back of their mind Oh, I think it's not, uh, I wouldn't even say it's a very specific thing. It's just generally that connection between the more you perform. And I think everyone has their own understanding of performance, um, the more you're loved. And I think that's, at least in, in my culture, um, that's a very, very strong, strong belief. And um, I, I feel that I can see in some expression or another, I, I feel I can see that in anyone. And so it's just, uh, I think it's about that expression, obviously, that's individual for, for everyone. I think that feeling that you have to almost earn your love can be really destructive for a person. Um, and I think uh, what you expressed earlier, Fedor, about wanting to be able to feel a little bit vulnerable. I don't know if you used the word vulnerable, but you wanted to show a softer side of yourself. Um, I think that I think those two things are very at odds feeling like we have to um kind of be be strong and powerful to deserve these sort of uh emotional nurturing from our friends from our partners from our family from whoever and then being able to show that uh that weaker side of ourselves uh i think there's a constant tension there and i think in being in a hyper competitive environment like poker all the time 
is really not healthy for it. I think even being, you know, I find when I play live poker, I get really exhausted. Just you're sitting at a table with a bunch of people and there's this constant tension between you two. You're, you're, you're battling, you're in conflict. And I think uh, when I was younger, I really loved that battle. Uh, but as I got older, I found myself uh, wanting to find more collaborative paths with the people around me and not to be in constant tension all the time and not to have no opportunity to show that vulnerable side. And I think, like you were saying, I don't think it's limited to poker. I think in all walks of life, people feel these things and it's a huge, uh, huge challenge. Is that part of why you started businesses and Grindhouse and Poker Code? Like there's a lot of things where it's like you've taken poker players and you've started collaborating with them instead of trying to just crush them all. <laughs> <laughs> I I would say parts of it. Um, and and it's there's so many different train of thoughts uh, that that go in there, I think. And it's not I, I would never say it's like, oh, you know, poker was this, and then after like business now is that is I could still feel a lot of these um that that same that's these same beliefs in different ways unfolding themselves and showing themselves in in the businesses I've been building and I would say there the main difference about the environment was um, that there's less feedback so that's a big thing in poker is this very clear or or more clear feedback higher volume more denomination in in dollars and. Um, that that's a big part where in business you have very little of that. There's much more variance and randomness in, in all of it. And, um, and then the other part uh, is the length, the commitment, the responsibility that, that that's really something I was, I, I didn't even realize in the beginning um, because I never thought about it. A poker tournament you played for a day, maybe two, maybe three, the commitment, there's no, there's no real commitment. You don't really have, employees or people you work with in a really intense way it's maybe a team of people but even that a lot of it is loose and and um very little responsibility for other people and and also therefore i think this practicing of really being taking responsibility for myself and and realizing the impact of my actions more clearly um that's definitely been a very big part of my journey because i realized wow when i start a business now that it's gonna let we're maybe gonna build this for five years or, or 10 years and and if i say yes now that's a that's a big commitment that's that's a long time frame and in the beginning i was just like yeah let's do this and let's do that and we can do that and we can start now oh great what an opportunity and so um i invested in tons of things and we built multiple companies and built teams around that and prime mind was the first thing we built um where it was just a, a a very nice driver and, and the beautiful side of it was this this excitement and this passion and it's really just sitting down and thinking about okay what's the what's the most valuable thing i experience and one of the things was definitely for me personally working with elliot and so how can i bring this to more people except just uh having one-on-one -on -one sessions with elliot so that that driver was beautiful but that idea of okay committing to um, that responsibility of managing this project and, and really seeing it through, I, I wasn't able to dissect it in these different um, parts of the process that are necessary to get to that point, right? Do I want to do that? Do I want to spend all that time on that development? Do I want to develop that product? Do, do I want to lead that company? Do I want to build a team for that? And all these questions I I didn't think about because I didn't never done it. So I didn't even realize that it's it's building blocks of, of part of that journey. And, and really you can see the differences now. I, I do much, much less than I was doing so much less. Maybe it could be less than 20% of what I was doing in year, you know, like in 17 and it's really stemming out. Of, I see much more. I have much more deal flow. I have much better deal flow. I, I know uh, a lot of people in the NSA just know all the time. It's, I want to, uh, I'm still curious. I still want to learn about things, but the things I invest in now or the things I really like both time or resources in any form, I want to really be involved in. I, I want to get to know the people. I want to understand the product. I want to contribute something. And if, if that process isn't naturally evolving, then it, then it doesn't make sense. Um, so that's something where I could see, oh, I made 20 investments in the first three years. And in the last two years, I made 
one and a half, two. So um, it's a very different, very different approach emotionally for me as well. We interrupt this podcast with a message from our sponsors at Run It Once. Right now, it's 30 week at Run It Once Poker. From now until Sunday, March 7th, players can earn an extra 30% rake back by playing in any of our SNG Select tournaments or 200 PLO cash games. For full details, head to once.run slash 30 week. That's once.run slash 30 W-E-E-K. And as always, if you're looking to improve your game, head on over to Run at Once Training, where you'll find the largest library of high quality poker training content on the web, created by some of the greatest minds in the game, including Run at Once founder, Phil Galfond. Sign up today at once.run slash learn, and you'll get free access to three elite videos from high stakes legends, Phil Galfond, Ben Sulsky, and Jason Kuhn. And now, back to the pod. Do you want to talk about what those two investments were recently and yeah. what uh, what about them made you say yes? Yeah, that's that's a good question. So um, one, you know, one is Poker Code, um, which was a big thing for me because it was about the investment of time as well. Um, and really ma- because I made these experiences before of how it feels to say yes to something. Then um, I invest money myself. I have investors in a company and then I just feel six months later or, or let's say 18 months later is like, wow, I, I feel like I can't really fulfill or, or want to, let's say want to fulfill these expectations that I put on myself. And then um, sharing that and openly saying like, hey guys, I, I started this yet yeah, um, really being honest and saying, I don't really feel like that. I'm not really committed to it. Let's find the best solution. This, this was very difficult for me because it felt like disappointing. It felt like letting down. Um, and so having these honest and open conversations was, was important, but the two things I'm working on right now, one is called poker code, you know, that one. Um, and the other one is, is actually a totally different area and it's a fashion studio. So I met someone, um, who I partnered up with, he's a um, like a very experienced tailor, and I just loved the way he was approaching um, the product and uh, or product in general. And we started collaborating two and a half years ago or two years ago, and we launched a, a fashion studio in Vienna where we make all the clothes ourselves. So it's shoes, pants, uh, jackets, shirts, pullover, like hoodies, jacket, like anything basically, and um, it. I love this project. Uh, we don't make money with it, but I absolutely love it because of the the love for the product, like learning so much about one area where um, similar to, to food where I feel I'm in touch with it since I'm young, but I never looked at it. I never, I never touched it in the same way I do now or never thought about it, where it comes from, how it's produced, how the material is being produced. How, how does this all work? And then suddenly I, I look at clothes in a totally different way. Um, when you buy something for $15 or $20, like it, 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 there's a totally different experience for me behind that and just making my own clothes and, and being in that creation process and, and picking the material myself and understanding how to sew and stuff like this. So, so there's a big part of that where I, where I found something um, to really want to understand things um, in depth and, and really understand the entire cycle. And I feel there's so many things that are very basic and substantial in my life, such as eating or, or my body or, or um, like what clothes I wear, um, where I feel I have, I, I just look at the surface. I just use the product. I don't even think about it. And, and I find a lot of joy in, in um, diving deeper into these things. And um, yeah, these are the two projects. And, and regarding the other question you asked, um, uh, Jamie around the collaboration part also I would say you know also there is a lot of a lot of um, let's say comments uh, I got around that um, around me making another training site and so on is really um, there's definitely part of it um, where I thought of it initially as oh it's an opportunity like there there is a very strong thought 
and methodical thought process in my head is like, okay, calculating and an equation and thinking about it in the frameworks I'm used to of how much money will it make? How much time will I need to invest? And then um, I realized very, very quickly, I there is basically no project that I really care about it enough to continuously do that. I Exactly the same process as poker is, yes, I could have made a lot more money with it, but I will not follow through if, if there's not something um, that is very independent from that, like a, a, a passion and a driver for that, that is extremely independent from the financial outcome. And the financial outcome is a thing I look at, but it's just uh, never more important than if I want to do it. And so with Poker Code, it's I, I realized that shift very in the early stages. And we, we changed and shifted the company and the culture very much naturally coming out of that towards just we really uh, want to have a great time there. And we want the people we work with to have a great time. So um, really turning that in a way where everyone feels like they're winning in that concept, uh, in that context, whether it's learning together um, or just having a good time together, like to not put it so much on this thing of I invest 90 euros here and then I need to get back 150 euros because I make more money in my game, but more around I invest in myself and uh, I enjoy the process. So, so that's, I think, the philosophy of of our company. Yeah, um, this is actually a good way to parlay into the little, or segue, excuse me, into the chess discussion because <laughs> um, it is so refreshing to find something that has nothing to do with money that yeah. you're not excelling at necessarily, but that like progressing at it um, and enjoying the process feels really good. Um, I was insanely competitive in sports and then started out in poker like that and then kind of got sick of it um, and then found chess recently. I should have found it a long time ago with like the shahadis being two of my best friends <laughs> and always wanting me to play. But I was like, ah, it's intimidating to play something that everyone is so good at already um but i love it i'm obsessed with puzzles and the chess puzzles that like, literally the score means nothing to anyone but me um and feeling like i'm progressing at it feeling my brain act differently like look at something differently feels so good and it's just so weird i'm not used to loving something that i suck at um I've been seeing that you've been streaming chess. You have been working with Hikaru to get chess lessons. Um, you are so far below your poker potential in chess because you're just starting out. Tell me about it. How did you start doing this? How'd you find it? Um, and what's your experience been like improving at something that like other people have, you know, 15 years on you already? Yeah, it's... Um, oh, it's so fun. It's really... Also, when I started this, I I can tell I've... Um, that's already one of the first points. I have much more fun uh, streaming chess than poker, <laughs> and yet obviously much more viewers when I stream poker. Um, but I don't like that's also a thing where I want to be more independent of these thoughts and just uh, if I enjoy it more, I do that more. And if I have two hundred viewers, I I don't care. I actually I actually love it. I I love that there's two hundred people like watching me play at sixteen hundred and and struggle. It's it's uh, I I really I, I really can feel that I have much more joy. Um, and creating that type of content. So I, I think what released me a lot is is trying to let go of that idea that it always needs to do something or I always need to do something so that there's a, that there needs to be something at the end of it because if I, the less I think about that, the more I actually just focus on, well, do I, is there something in it right now? Like, is it is it something I really want to do? And then with chess, uh, it's exactly that is there is nothing else in it. I... Um, I could feel that there were a lot of sparks in me. Oh, let's make it more competitive. You know, let's make a bet or let's do partake in a tournament or da da da. And then I realized, well, okay, let's take that slot. Let's just play or let me just play when I really want to. And it turned into, um, so I, I played as a child, as a kid for one to two years in a club. And then now 15 years later, I picked it up again started playing again last year and it was just about I played a game a day basically mm -hmm. and then now it's two or three games and now I started streaming and it's maybe five to seven games a day and um, I just love how that develops out of a yeah there's no money in it I'm never gonna be a big chess streamer 
Um, it's just super fun to do. This is so funny too, because your approach to poker was go so hard at it. Let it consume your life. Your approach to business was say yes to 20 businesses, let it consume your life. And then with chess, you're like played one game a day, then two, you are approaching this completely different than something you're trying to, um, dominate. And I feel similar about it. It's just a fun game. It's like, as a kid, you play stuff because it's fun. You go hang out with your friends, you ride bikes. You don't go like, what am I getting out of riding bikes? Um, and I think, you know, is that how this chess feels to you? It's like an outlet where you just don't have to achieve anything. Yeah, it's, it's nice. It's refreshing. I, I, it's interesting that Jamie talked about approaching it like you were a kid and you were just playing for fun. And Fedor, I know you said you played for a couple of years on a club team when you were a kid. Do you find that connecting with your childhood brings back, because you spoke about poker being, having a little bit of that childlike curiosity, that mentality through hands. Do you find that connecting with things that brought you joy, I don't know if being in the chess club brought you joy, but that connecting with things in your childhood brings that curiosity, that playfulness out of you more? And is that something that you deliberately seek? Mm. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's the connection that I've played it as a child. Um, I would say it's generally, I, I can see that in lots of different areas. Um, if I play a new card game, for example, I have the exact same joy. Is I, I just love figuring it out and then playing with friends. So I, I love games in general and anything that is around this, this middle ground between a, a fun, entertaining time and where I feel I'm really in it. Like this is really, that's why I don't like games where I'm not um, tested, let's say it like that. So when it's, when everything is just super clear, it's like Uno or something. I, I, I don't enjoy this game so much because I, I love this exact middle between. It doesn't need to be super complicated, but a little bit so that I actually, um, yeah, that I am in this flow of thinking and then also having fun and, and, and playing with friends. So um, the chess part actually, I feel chess and poker and mostly uh, most environments I get really good at are quite similar. It's I I start out just with that, as you said, childish curiosity. Um, then I get very quickly very good, and then there it it becomes like the environment changes. There's more pressure, more expectations, and then I remove myself. Mm -hmm. So, so that's been uh, a very common theme um, or I go too much in it. Like that's also, I, I go longer than I want to is then I'm like, okay, I force myself, but um, it's basically mostly been that type of path. I think I learned kind of the same way and I experience it the same way, probably to a lesser degree than you, but I, I enjoy the child, like the puzzling through um, the, the figuring stuff out and finding maybe uh, a unique solution or a unique approach or or those moments where you have a click and then, uh, you know, at some point you raise yourself to the level of competence that you can't get past with, with sort of just natural talent and natural curiosity and natural figuring stuff out. And then it really becomes quite a grind to improve past that point. So you're either plateauing and you're getting less and less that click or that that unfamiliar it's hard to stay curious uh when you've got into that point uh, and it sounds like that's quite similar to what you're describing yeah but it i i feel this plateau thing people are talking about is um there's so much judgment coming with it it's it's really i always thought i i, I don't know how often i thought as a child i'm a failure is I, I had such a such a bad connection to this idea of quitting. Is I always I always was very um, indulging in self pity around. Oh, I'm I'm quitting the next. I'm stopped. Like everyone wants me to continue. I I go again and I hate it. I started to hate it more and more and more till I quit and don't go anymore and and find excuses to not go and avoid going and could be piano lessons, could be school, could be chess. Um, could be sports. I was good at like anything where I was just um, that, that force that um, then turns into, so I, I never was a, a person that 
continue to fork. Like I, I rather I rather rebelled in that way or remove myself than than to keep forcing myself. I I saw a lot of uh, children around me who just kept doing it. Then they mm -hmm. they just kept taking piano lessons for six years. I I didn't go. I was just like you had no way of getting me there. As I did it two times, and then I, and so then I, I feel the the punishment was this this subtle form of disappointment. Mm -hmm. Um, and that really stuck with me. It's like, that really is, I adopted that idea of, okay, when I quit something like that's disappointing. And I think now I think it's beautiful. I think it's beautiful to try out lots of different things, try it out for an hour, try it out for five hours. And then, you know how, it, like, I think there's nothing better than at the age of 20, 25, that's the best multiplier is like that's when you have 60 years ahead of you that's mm -hmm. when you should try out everything and try it out for one hour try it out for five hours figure out what you want to do what you don't want to do um and then you you know so much more about uh about how you compose what you want where you want to develop into so a hundred percent it's you know instead of thinking about quitting something it's not like when you quit something you're going to spend that time sleeping instead it's like you're going to spend that time uh, finding something you know else me? that well, Ben will spend the time sleeping instead, but <laughs> uh, finding something else you love to do or that brings you joy or um, I was, I've been creeping your Instagram, a new relationship. You funnel some of the time into something <laughs> that's more fulfilling, that will make you happy. And then maybe that will make you um, better, more productive, more fulfilled in something else that's really meant for you. This is me asking Great. about your relationship without being that nosy. I, I got it. <laughs> I got it. Uh, yeah, I'm very happy. It, she, I mean, she's uh, amazing. She's a very, very beautiful being. Wow, you really transcended the whole poker world. Where like people are just like making up fake girlfriends that you know you don't know her. She lives in Canada, that kind of thing. Um, Is but, like, that actually away. happening? <laughs> it's more of like a meme where you're just like, yeah, my really hot girlfriend. You don't know Dana. her. She goes to school. <laughs> but it looks like you figured stuff out. You've um, stepped away from poker. Then you've come back to it a little bit. You've crushed some businesses. You have a relationship. You're pretty happy. And then now you're coming back to poker for this challenge <laughs> that I feel like everyone will murder us if we don't talk about it at least a little bit. Um, but also to stir the pot, since you've been on other pods and this just came out, uh, Doug Polk got into the mix today. Did you see that? I just read it and I actually could feel that... Um, it's the, you know, stuff like this still hurts. And it's, it's, really? uh, oh. yeah, it's, um, it's not, I would probably not think about it tomorrow, but in the moment when I read it, it's, um, I think it hurts because I cannot uh, identify the background. I think especially written things, it's um, often like, I, I have no real relationship with him. Or, mm -hmm. or like we we've not really talked in the last couple of years. I when we talked, he was always quite nice, and I um, I could tell that like back in the days, he was very like there was a lot of battle in him, and um, and uh, I, I think he's a very competitive guy. But um, I I feel like I got much much better at um, liking a variety of different people, and mm -hmm. um, especially mostly because I. I try to tune down my own judgment whenever I really don't really know the background or, or like I, for a lot of reasons, uh, for a lot of things, I don't know what's going on inside them and what they're feeling and what they're experiencing. And I, um, I, it rather makes me curious around, you know, what is he experiencing around that? And I think when I read it, um, the, I think at first it sparks this initial, um this what i talked about before like this feeling of hey okay like you know he's uh he doesn't like me you know or he, he's uh i i can't even it's it's hard to explain but just this thing of like oh he's attacking me and then, a little bit and of an ego I, flash he, mm, yeah i mean he's a, he like that's the thing is i i feel it a lot of it is sparked from the way the challenge is set up you know that the content that has been posted and it's um I feel then oftentimes you, uh, you, you, if you would sit down and talk about it, like it would just be whatever. That's also why I love being on podcasts where I can give a bit more of my own context to exactly challenges like this, where um, I think over time I got more and more confident and, and independent in, in how, who, how I think about myself and what I think of myself and that it doesn't matter so much uh, what others think about me. 
Um, but yeah, I'm actually really curious in what sparked uh, sparked him posting that. Just briefly, because it was only five minutes before we were going to have you on. So Ben and I just had a quick discussion about it. And I was like, this is very weird. I'm very good friends with Doug. This is odd. I would be very shocked if he didn't like you. Um, but also there's usually some angle to this, right? It's usually there's some goal in mind that Doug has either he wants Victor, to have some heads up Victor, match. Victor, playing Victor. Or yeah, yeah. Me really coming be. out like, oh, yeah, we yeah. got to wreck this guy. Yeah, but also like it yeah. could also be something else that's completely unrelated to your guy's skill level or him wanting to play heads up. It could be like, oh, he's thinking of placing a bet on poker shares and he wants the line to be different. Like it could literally be anything. I would love to talk to Doug about this because it was so like out of left field. Um, I'm I'm sorry that it, it hurt your feelings a little. Like it... it because really it it could just be him trolling he's like a little bored so, like that's also it's it's oftentimes like that's also something is i'm not blaming him you know mm-hmm. like it's it's totally fine i i i think that's often also as earlier i was much more around oh that did that with me and he's the reason why you know but i don't i i didn't want to uh, express it that way it's totally fine that he posted that he can he can post whatever he wants um it was more that was the initial feeling i read it and i was like huh okay that does something with me and then mm-hmm. I, I I felt and I was like, oh, okay, you know, there's this, this, like, um, this fighting child. I was like, no, you know, I'm I'll not bad. You. I'm like, I'm going to yeah. show it to you. Yep. And then, um, and then afterwards, like, it was more actually 30 seconds later or a minute later, it turned into curiosity where I was really, wow, okay, interesting. And, and you know, why did you post that? And then mm-hmm. I was actually thinking the same way. Is there like, is some there, other angle? is there some thought behind that? But it's really more, um, something like an opportunity for myself to uh to get to know myself a bit better um so one of the things i'm very excited about i had covered a little bit of the maybe like 10 of the doug streams i got to do a little commentary and stuff and the whole cards down was always a bummer everyone in twitch was just complaining about it hey we, we don't know what's going on especially for a format that a lot of people don't play. It, it was harder to follow. Mm. Um, I'm really excited you're doing whole cards up and that you're going to commentate some of it yourself. Um, can you talk about how you and Limitless decided um, that this is what you were, were going to do? Um, it was basically, I mean, may, maybe it'll give, uh, me giving some background is sure. I, I'm not a feud personality. Like I'm not <laughs> going to war with anyone is for me, uh, I think you can tell that uh, obviously they're the the way they're picking the content is also to obviously spark a bit of a bit of fire and, and create that feud. But for me personally, I like Victor a lot. He, he's mm-hmm. a he's a great guy. Um, obviously, I mean this is this is a challenge. Like I, I'm not gonna go in there and be like, ah, oh, you know, here take my money. I, I'm gonna give my best. And I it's also what Doug posted is like I I don't think I'm. Uh, a great no limit heads up player like for me this is um i I love this moment of um testing myself and really looking into okay like this is one possible environment could be could be anything else um and i think it's going to be very fun for me like i I really think i'm going to enjoy the next two weeks a lot uh both learning more about uh, no limit heads up both playing the sessions um and i i think the bigger thing is it's i think it's going to be really entertaining content so we're going to stream the match um it's going to be 100 200 we're going to play one table you're going to see the cards with a 30 minute delay face up and um we're going to be on a zoom call and um the thing he said before is that he's going to be drinking that's kind of the the thing he brought up is like i i'm going to crush you drunk so that is kind of the the setting of the thing. So I I think it's just going to be really really fun. Like that's gotta, that's my thing. I I think I'm gonna I'm gonna be tested. I'm gonna be challenged, and it's gonna be a fun format. So that that to me is the the whole spark of the thing. Might I suggest sending him a breathalyzer test, like so that we can just get like a live update on the on the stream where it's like okay point one, like he can't drive that, anymore or whatever, and just because I want to know exactly like how serious this playing drunk thing is. I, I would like to know. That's actually a great idea. I think we got to watch out a little bit with promoting uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> drinking while gambling. But um, but yeah, I, I like the idea. Uh, Peter, I know you got to go and do another one of these things. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on and taking the time to speak with us. Uh, it's been 
enlightening and insightful. And I think uh, talking to you is you're I think you're one of the most interesting people in and around poker. And it's just kind of always a joy to to see what you're thinking. So thank you for coming on and doing this with us. Yeah, I also my, my real motivation for having you on though um, is to demand a, an apology from three or four years ago, where you said on Twitter, I just realized something about my two favorite people on Twitter. Feraldo eighty seven poker is the Scottish version of Jamie Kerstetter. I'm demanding an apology. I said my life is ruined. You said I'm like Neil. Like uh, I just want to know exactly um, what you were doing when you were giving that the most backhanded compliment I've ever received. I mean, he's hilarious, isn't he? <laughs> I think, Jamie, this is a good teaching moment for you. Your feelings are not about what Fedor posts. Fedor can post whatever he wants. <laughs> exactly. This is an opportunity you for you shit, to, to grow and learn and <laughs> understand where your feelings are coming from. So I just have to acknowledge that I looked at that and went, oh, my God, he's comparing me to Feraldo. And then I have to go, oh, OK, like, why does this hurt my ego? I have to think about it and try to improve as a person. All right, I'll figure it out. I'll have Sounds like a lot of work. Sounds like a lot of work. I have. Uh, I love. I, I love how in two sentences Ben just uh, twisted the entire thing to. <laughs> <laughs> Ben's the best. No, this has really been awesome. I love talking to you. Um, I hope the challenge goes amazingly well. Um, I hope your chess goes well as well as well. Yeah, that's great. I know words. Um, I hope your sewing yeah, goes well. How's how's your sewing still <laughs> coming along? Uh, much better now. I I'm. Uh, I'm actually gonna start uh, making the first hoodies that I'm actually also gonna um, send to friends and potentially also sell. We we have to look a little bit with the price because I don't. Again, this is one of the things where you know then it's like oh he's trying to you know make a ton of money with with clothing. I'm like no, um, but yeah, like, probably uh, I'm gonna actually put out some stuff. So cool. in case That's someone cool. wants something soon by me, then you can have your. <laughs> Well, I'm going to be watching uh, watching all of your pursuits with interest. And uh, thanks again for thanks. doing this. You're welcome.